Hi folks, this is a video about vegetation on coastal plains. It's about what's known as succession, or the types of plants that, in a succession, form the ecosystem on the coast. We're not going to be looking at rocky cliffs. We talked about that in the previous video, but we're going to be looking at coastal plains. We're going to be looking at sand dunes, or samoseas, and haloseas, or salt marshes. We're going to be looking at these because these are the two types of coastal plain environments in which successions are important in uh, creating coastal features. So let's have a look first at the basics. We're looking at coastal vegetation. Coastal vegetation has to be able to withstand salt water, has to be able to um, withstand a dynamic equilibrium of sand and sediment and things moving around all the time. It also has to be able to put up with uh, extremes of temperature, often very dry um, conditions as well. So they've got to be tough. They've got to be tough plants. Um, and we're going to be looking uh, first at samoseas or sand dunes. So here we have a profile of a samosea. So at this end we've got the land and at this end we've got the sea. So right up to where the sea meets the land here. First off we've got the embryo and fore dunes. This is the first section of the samosea. The embryo dunes are the very first dunes down by the sea and the fore dunes come after it. So these are small dunes, these are the most dynamic, they change the most, tend not to have as many plants in them. Come back to stage, we've got the yellow dunes. They're yellow because they tend to be more permanent, often have a bit more water in them. The water table, i.e. the height of the water within the ground, is a little bit higher, so it tends to be a bit more moisture, but it's salt water generally. fixed dunes, we've got the grey dunes. Now these are becoming more and more permanent, they don't move as much and they tend to have more soil in them as well. So we've got increased quantity of soil, not always as high as the yellow dunes, sometimes higher. It's dynamic, it changes. If there's a lot of wind as well, we get what's called a dune slack. This is where the wind blows away parts of the dunes, particularly towards the back of the fixed dunes and the yellow dunes and creates these dips. So there's always this movement. And then we get back to the heath and the woodland. This is where now the water is becoming a lot less salty, becoming more like the ground as we would know it. So it's soil rather than sand. So with distance from the sea, increase in the amount of soil, decrease in the amount of salt, decrease in the amount of sand. Now, samoseas are made up of two types of plants, halophytes and xerophytes. Halophytes are salt tolerant. They can deal with being in salty conditions, and they tend to be in the yellow and embryo slash fore dunes. Xerophytes are dry tolerant. They can deal with very low amounts of moisture. They tend to be up towards the fixed dunes and the yellow dunes because they're higher up, they're out of the way of a lot of moisture, and sand doesn't hold water. So when it rains, it just runs straight through. It's not just a case of halophyte, xerophyte, completely separate from each other. It's like a Venn diagram, you get a bit of both. Marum grass is a classic on dunes, because marum grass has got very waxy leaves, so it can deal with extreme conditions, got very long roots, it grow, and it grows very fast, so the long roots help it to stabilise the dune and to get as much water as possible, and it grows very fast, so if sand piles on top of it, it will keep growing through. But you go from little teeny tiny little plants down here, to thicker, bigger plants over here, up to woodland here, and that's why it's a succession, it goes from tiny plants up to bigger plants. If you look at a halo seer, however, 
or a salt marsh, like the ones that are in many river estuaries, they're a different environment. These tend to be very sheltered areas, they tend to have sediment inputs from rivers and things because they're estuaries where rivers meet the sea. This means they tend to be flatter, got the heath at the back, but then they get very flat very quickly. And most importantly, they actually go beneath the high tide line, particularly in the areas closest down towards the shore. This means that we're looking particularly at halophytes. They don't have to be dry tolerant because they're always submerged, but they do have to be salt tolerant. Although because it's a mixture of river water and sea water, the water tends to be what's known as brackish, half salty, not fully salty. They get these plants that can live half in water and half out of water, almost amphibious. Towards the back, you get it then above the high tide line and above the water table, and you get back towards the heath and the woodland. These plants have to be very resilient to the salt, but they don't tend to move around as much, or the, the, the land doesn't move around as much as sand dunes. still moves around a lot, because there's always deposition and transportation, but it's not quite as mobile as a sand dune. Now the relevance of all this is that these plants make their way up, and as we go from the, sort of the very um, early ones um, up to the pioneer, plants moving towards what's known as the uh, climactic species, i.e. the ones at the end, at the climax of where it can be. This succession holds the land together and binds it more and more and more. And you get the growth, almost like an evolution, of plants. So Haloceas and Samoceas are very important in holding together parts of the coast, particularly that which has been deposited. And if we're thinking about things like mangroves, very, very important for uh, dealing with storms and large waves. They will get moved around by that, they will be damaged by storms and large waves. All part of being a dynamic coast, isn't it? So it's not a problem as such. But these are very important things. Anyway, if you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.